Good afternoon or welcome. I'm Jennifer Devere Brody, the faculty director here at the Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity. And I am really thrilled um, to welcome you to this event, which is part of our faculty research fellows program that celebrates a new work by Stanford faculty through a quarterly book salon or Chautauqua. And today we are going to welcome our final Chautauqua for the year. We began with Matt Clare and then we had Usha Iyer. And today we welcome our colleague, Professor John Krosnick, who is the editor of the forthcoming Cambridge Handbook of Implicit Bias and Racism. So before we begin the event proper, I want to acknowledge, as we always do, that we are on unceded land. And I'm going to take a moment to share with you from a video made with some of our students um, that acknowledges the history and continued importance um, of this fact. Stanford sits on the territory of Huichin, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Muwekma Ohlone tribe, who are the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County. This land was, and continues to be, of great importance to Native people. We recognize that every member of the community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to, to Native people. Thank you. Um, I want to, before again, we really begin our special event today. Uh, I will alert you to a few events coming up here at the center with which you're welcome to join. The first will be next week, April 28th and 29th, part of our uh, Centering Race Consortium with Yale, Brown and the University of Chicago. We're doing a conference called Racial Reckonings and the Future of the Humanities. Um, and you can join uh, on our website is the information. So too, we'll be looking at uh, the Technology and Race Racial Equity Conference. That's in May the 19th and the 20th. We're putting these up in the chat for you to see. And there we're gonna be talking about anti-racist technologies for a just future. And that includes our Kiva lecture with uh, Ruha Benjamin, a scholar at Princeton, who is one of the foremost thinkers on looking at questions of racial justice and technology. Finally, we're very thrilled that on June 4th, we'll be celebrating CCSRE's 25th anniversary. And we're having a major event uh, called Strength and Solidarity, 25 years of education, research, and community, all of our values that uh, I think it encapsulates what we, the work that we do at the center. We'll be honoring our original founding director, Al Camarillo, and uh, all of our community. So please join us on June 4th. Again, this is coming up in the chat. And speaking of which, I want to invite you, the audience, to use the chat functions for any questions. This is a webinar style. Um, and there'll also be a survey coming out that uh, we would love to have you fill out during the time that we have together. So now to the main event. Uh, I want to introduce to you our presenters for today. First, John Krosnick, who's the winner of the American Association for Public Opinions Research Lifetime Achievement Award for Outstanding Research and the Nevitt Stanford Career Award from the International Society of Political Psychology. Uh, he's born in my hometown, Princeton, New Jersey, and is now the Feder Frederick O. Glover Professor in Humanities and Social Sciences at Stanford and Professor of Communication, Political Science, and by courtesy, Psychology. And that kind of interdisciplinary work is what we so value, and we're thrilled to have you with us today, John. In addition, he directs the Political Psychology Research Group, a team of research staff, postdocs, grad students, and undergrads, his PhD is in social psychology from the University of Michigan, and he spent eight years, 18 years, sorry, at Ohio State before joining us. In 2005, he brought, 
brought the NSF-funded American National Election Study Survey Project to Stanford, which provides cutting-edge survey data to scholars worldwide who study voting in the U.S. And a lot of the work you're going to hear about today stems from a really a wonderful article he did around the election of Obama in 2008, looking at racial bias. He'll be joined in conversation by Professor Alfredo Artiles, the Lee Jacks Professor of Education, and we're very pleased to say our new Director of Research at CCSRE. His programmatic work uh, engages questions of how do educational equity remedy create uh, new injustices and what are effective ways to reduce these paradoxes. His scholarship examines the dual nature of disability as an object of protection and a tool of stratification in largely educational systems. Dr. Artiles served on the Obama White House Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for Hispanics, and he is the elected member to the National Academy of Education, a fellow in AREA, and the National Education Policy Center. He was a, a resident fellow at the Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Sciences and is part of the Graduate School of Education here at Stanford. So with that, um, I have you look at their further bios in the link, and I think we can just uh, begin the seminar. Thank you so much for being here. Jennifer, thank you so much. Welcome to everyone. It's a great pleasure to be a part of this series and a part of the center. Uh, it is such a great thing to see on this campus, a center of intellectual activity with the vigor that this group brings. And I'm honored to be a part of it and especially honored to have the opportunity today to share a bit of a story with you about the work that I've been doing in this arena. Uh, I'm actually going to use some slides and tell you very quickly the story uh, of this book and a part of the book in detail. So let me um, share my screen and then I will make things look pretty, I hope. Okay, I think we're good. All right, so this, um, the, the title of the book actually has changed a little bit since um, you heard it uh, three minutes ago. Um, we, in, in this book has been in process for a while and in light of what has happened in the last year and in light of the contents of the book, um, the title is a bit longer. It's the Cambridge Handbook of Implicit Bias, Explicit Bias and Racism. And my co-editors of the book are Toby Stark. Toby was a pre-doctoral fellow here at Stanford and a postdoc at Stanford um, before he returned to Europe and joined the faculty at Utrecht University. I can't help but tell you, I think I, I understand that he is the youngest person ever to have been tenured on their faculty. Um, and Amanda Scott is also our collaborator. Amanda got a PhD in social psychology at Ohio State when I was teaching there, and she and I have been working together for a long time. Uh, I wanna tell you about how Cambridge University Press decided that they wanted to see this book come about. Um, and the roots of it were in a 2017 conference that the National Science Foundation sponsored at its headquarters in Washington. Normally when NSF sponsors conferences, they're perfectly happy for the uh, academic hosts of the conferences to have them at their own institutions. But in this case, um, there was enough broad interest of NSF personnel that they asked us to actually hold it in their building. And they had just moved to the new building that they're in now in Alexandria that's kind of pretty fancy and impressive. So we were happy to be the inaugural guests there. Um, and the instigator for this conference was um, a message that came to a an oversight board that I was serving on that um, the Social Behavioral and Economic Sciences Directorate was thinking about instigating some implicit bias training um, because there was a concern that there might be implicit bias influencing the reviews of grant proposals that they process. And when our oversight committee heard about this interest, a few of us went to the director and mentioned to her um, the question that in fact, this might be before instigating a training program, a good time to ask the big question, what is the state of evidence on training effectiveness? And in fact, one of the three of us was a major contributor to the literature on implicit bias. And she was particularly concerned that uh, evidence on the effectiveness of implicit bias training um, at the time was not especially compelling. And the notion being that if you think about implicit bias as something unconscious, um, to train it in a conscious 
way, if it's the result of a lifetime of experience to train or to retrain quickly, uh, is maybe a lot to ask for. And at the time, there wasn't an established literature convincing in that way. And so what the director had decided to do was to hold this conference to review the implicit bias literature broadly. And the goals were, first of all, not only to take stock of that literature and really assess what have we learned at this point, but secondly, to identify opportunities for future research, because that's, of course, NSF's business uh, and everything they do, they're looking for uh, opportunities to learn about what can they fund that will have big payoff in the future. And uh, to also not only identify those opportunities, to, but to create enthusiasm for those funding opportunities um, through the dissemination of the insights in this book. And so we were very pleased to get this opportunity. Um, and one of the key ideas that uh, was a part of the plan from the very beginning was to be sure that although implicit bias was a notion born in social psychology, that we would have individuals from sociology and political science at a minimum who had been studying uh, prejudice and racism from various different perspectives in the room to build some bridges that maybe had not existed so much before. And that absolutely happened at the conference. I'm gonna show you very quickly, uh, just in case you happen to recognize any names or institutions, this is what we called the reporting committee. This was a group of people who came to the meeting and whose job was essentially to listen. There were a couple of presenters, but mostly these folks listened to what was presented and they were tasked with writing a report to summarize um, the, the conclusions and implications of the meeting uh, in an essay which appears in the book. And if you look on the right-hand side, quickly down the side, you'll see psychologists, political scientists, sociologists, and uh, Gary Langer from the commercial world. Um, and these are the presenters and contributors to the conference and the book. Um, you can see it's, uh, if you know the field, it's a who's who of individuals in these areas, and uh, not only a US group, but an international group as well. And um, today, I don't have time to review the entire book for you. What I can tell you is I think what's the, the maybe one of the most exciting elements of the book is the reporting committee's essay that talks from a very elementary viewpoint about what is it actually that we're trying to measure when we set out either with implicit bias measures or explicit bias measures. What, from a traditional social psychological theory of attitudes, um, what are we trying to measure? And how do traditional and new measurement techniques map onto that definition? And I think that, that one of the things I'm most proud about in the accomplishments of everybody participating in the book is that reporting committee's uh, back to basics um, innovation, and I think exciting, I would even call them somewhat conceptual breakthroughs for this literature. That was very cool. Um, there are also sections of the book that talk about um, how to think about measurement, what we know about the effects of implicit bias, um, what the, the puzzles and problems are in that literature, how we can consider that literature in light of research on explicit prejudice and what directions the field should take in the future. And so um, with the consent of Daniel and Alfredo um, in our meeting yesterday, um, I am going to tell you a story of just a little piece of this, which I think at least has an interesting take home message for you. And I think it gives you a feel for at least a part of what has developed in this area. And um, just to be clear, folks who have been studying, scholars who have been studying anti-Black racism and racism of other kinds have done so um, from many different vantage points with many different methodologies in many different disciplines in many different countries. And today I'm focused on the United States and I'm focused on anti-Black racism in particular. And I'm focused on questionnaire-based measurement. And um, in that literature, one of the most important books is this, written by Howard Schumann, Charlotte Stee, and Larry Bobo. Um, Howard passed away a few days ago um, at, uh, at a very old age, having lived a wonderful life uh, on the coast of Maine, where he retired after leaving the University of Michigan. And um, he wrote this extremely important book that galvanized our understanding of American attitudes on uh, African-American prejudice in particular. And um, if you look closely at the book, what you can see is that it focused on what I might call government policy and social policy having to do with uh, relations between races. So uh, for example, th there is a chat, this, so this is a book that reviews many, many national surveys collected over a very long period of time. Um, one is questions about principles of equal treatment. Should 
African Americans and whites be treated equally or not, um, how to implement that equal treatment. Um, social distance is the notion that uh, in, in the old days that some individuals preferred distance between black people and white people. Um, that's a, a measure of attitude. Um, there are uh, there's a, a uh, discussion of beliefs about inequality. What are the causes of inequality and what solutions might there be? There's a discussion of affirmative action. There, the real focus here is very much on inequality and policy. And um, this is a typical graph in the book. Um, it shows you trends over time. In this case, depending upon which line you look at, uh, either starting in 1942 or 1963, and ending in either 1984 or 2005. These are these dots. Their squares, I guess, are uh, survey questions asking about: Do you think black students and white students should attend the same schools or different schools? And this is a question asking about: Do you think it should be legal for uh, black and white people to marry each other? And as you can see, only minorities of uh, the American public in very high quality random sample surveys endorsed these two viewpoints in the early points of the time series. And by the end, these numbers are up at 80% or greater. And it's that kind of progress. And by the way, note gradual progress, very smooth progress over this time period, no radical sharp interruptions that um, was a kind of typical view uh, as the result of this book of where racial attitudes had come in America. But in the 1970s, two scholars, David Sears at UCLA and Don Kinder, his student then, now a professor at the University of Michigan, raised a question. They said, you know what? We actually doubt that those results are accurately characterizing America. We think there's quite a bit of anti-Black racism still present in the country, but respondents are not acknowledging it in those surveys. And what they decided was needed was a new type of measure, which they called symbolic racism, and it's measured with uh, a different type of survey question, still survey questions that are asked to people, um, an interviewer to a respondent. But the definition of symbolic racism that Sears and Kinder proposed was that it had two ingredients. One is anti-Black affect. And here I'm using affect the way social psychologists do to refer to an emotional reaction. And secondly, the belief that Black people violate traditional American values. What Sears and Kindred argued is that that combination of those two is what constitutes symbolic racism. And they focused on two particular American values. One, the idea that all people should have equal opportunities to succeed and get rewards in life. And secondly, that in order to get those rewards, people should have to work hard to get them, yeah, sometimes called individualism and egalitarianism. And what they said was that symbolic racists endorse those two values and they believe that black people do not endorse those values. And that perception is coupled with anti-black affect. That's what constitutes symbolic racism. And they developed a measure of symbolic racism that involved asking lots of different, still self-report questions that were asked directly by an interviewer. Here's an example of one. Respondents were asked, do you agree or disagree with this statement? It's really a matter of some people not trying hard enough. If blacks would only try harder, they could be just as well off as whites. So you can see how this is kind of about effort and it's about, is there really discrimination or there's the discrimination and inequality, the result of a lack of effort instead. Secondly, here's another example. Do you agree or disagree with this statement? Irish, Italian, Jewish, and many other minorities overcame prejudice and worked their way up. Blacks should do the same. So again, it's about effort and about the idea that discrimination can be overcome by the individuals who are experiencing it, and that should be done as well in this case. This construct, symbolic racism, uh, and this type of indirect questioning approach that doesn't ask, do you like or dislike black people uh, so bluntly, has been extremely popular in social psychology. It has traveled under different names. Uh, it became a, a slightly different set of questions with the label modern racism. And then more recently, Don Kinder developed a new uh, measure of racial resentment, uh, all very similar questions uh, and similar in spirit, allowing people, the designers said, to express their racist attitudes, but to hide them in a cloak of discussion of classic American values. Fast forward to the 1980s. Along came the third generation of this literature. 
And this is the book Blind Spot. By the way, that uh, black circle on the cover is on every single cover. It's, a, it's intentionally there to prevent us from seeing the entire title, written by Marzu Banaji and Tony Greenwald. Marzu and Tony were at Ohio State in the social psychology program when I went there uh, as a new faculty member. And it was not much longer later when they developed this notion of implicit bias. And their starting point was very similar to the Sears and Kinder starting point, but their argument rejected even symbolic racism measures in the following way. And I apologize, I'm gonna show you what ended up having to be pictures of paper, pieces of paper in the book, because I couldn't find scans of them. So I hope you'll put up with the curved lines here. And I hope you'll let me actually read this out loud to you because I think this is worth hearing. Um, they, what the author said is, we left science in the background, this is in the middle of the introductory chapter, we left science in the background while describing the various pressures to produce less than truthful answers to questions. However, when these same forces operate to influence answers given by participants in a scientific study, the accuracy of the study's results may be seriously compromised. And that is, of course, a concern to us. If answers to questions, as matter of fact, as those about age, height, and weight, can be inaccurate. What should we assume about the limits of what can be learned from question answering, asking research on topics as highly charged as a person's racial attitudes or other forms of bias? In the absence of reliable checks on accuracy, such as those that can be provided by scales and rulers when asking about weight or height, it's remarkably difficult to assess whether a person is telling the truth in answering a survey question. That's why when evaluating the honesty of people applying for jobs that involve access to confidential or secret documents, government agencies rely not just on questions directed to the applicant, but also on interviews with friends, relatives, teachers, work colleagues, and past employers. But these methods are themselves imperfect. So the argument here is that in order to understand racial attitudes, we have to bypass the matter of fact question asking that has been typical in this literature in the past. They said, the first scientific studies of attitudes toward racial and ethnic groups were conducted in the 1920s and 1930s using the only methods available, asking questions and compiling the self-reported answers. It was only after 40 years of question-based research that psychologists began to appreciate and eventually to document the types of deviations from accuracy that we have described in this chapter. There is now no doubt that impression management produces flawed, inaccurate responses to many questions that have long been used to measure racial prejudice. So that's the stage setting for the introduction of implicit bias. How is implicit bias measured? Well, it's now measured with three leading techniques. One is called the implicit association test that Tony and Marzu developed. A second is the affect misattribution procedure developed by Keith Payne. And the third is sometimes called the bona fide pipeline developed by Russ Fazio. The spirit of all three of these are that a respondent is asked to do something and does it typically on a computer, but the respondent is not asked any explicit or symbolic question about racial attitudes. They're in fact doing very different tasks. And the spirit of these measures is to get directly into the brain if possible, so that we can bypass not only people's in, uh, desires to present themselves in misleading and socially desirable ways, but also to tap into racism, even if people are not aware of it. And that's one of the central arguments of this literature. So I would just wanna show you very quickly how the affect misattribution procedure works. The participants see a series of Chinese ideographs one at a time on a computer screen like this, and they're asked to push one of two buttons on the computer keyboard each time they see the ideograph, either to push the I like it more button or the I like it less button. There are 22 of these uh, ideographs that they see, and they're asked to sort about 11 into each pile. Um, these are not people fluent in this language, and these are just sort of pieces of art and without any strong basis for liking and disliking. And this was set up intentionally because Keith uh, had something else going on that the participants don't know about. Immediately preceding each appearance of an ideograph was a subliminal flash of a different photograph. And so in this case, I'm showing you, this would be in the same place as the ideograph. This is a case of a smiling baby, of course, um, and at, so the, the baby flashes very quickly, the ideograph remains on the screen for a few seconds, and it's covered then by this mask, and that kind of hides the baby from the retina. 
And the idea is for judges, participants, to sort these ideographs. Um, what they don't realize is that the affect, the emotion, the positive or negative feeling they get is caused by this subliminal picture, not by this, the character itself. And so they say, hmm, when I see this character, it makes me feel a little bit good or a little bit bad, so I'll put it into one of these two piles. It's essentially affect spillover. And um, in the racial attitudes measurement case, half of the pictures are of the faces of white Americans and half of the faces are pictures of African Americans. And the idea is if there is evidence of bias, then the uh, ideographs following the white faces will be more often in the liked pile and less often in the disliked pile. So that's how that works. Um, for those of you who don't know the IAT, the Implicit Association Test, I'm not going to go through this in great detail, but it's quite a challenging task. It lasts a while. There are four different kinds of trials. Um, in each case, either a word or a face appears in the center of the screen. So these are four different example screens, one, two, three, and four. And so you might, uh, you're always asked to put two fingers on two keyboards, uh, on the keyboard, and there are two buttons. In this case, the right button means bad, the left button means good. And the participant is told each time they see a word, they should push the appropriate button to indicate whether it's a good or a bad word. Then here, they're asked to look at a series of faces and asked to push a button if it looks like a European American or an African American. Um, here, they see both words and pictures, and their job is to push this button if it's a European American or a good word, push this button if it's an African American or a bad word, and then the instructions switch here and they're again seeing pictures and words. The idea of the measurement is to look at reaction time. If you've ever done it, it's very easy to feel that when uh, the pairings change, your speed changes. Um, and that's exactly what they're after. So I wanna show you some results with those implicit measures, but I wanna show them to you after I introduce you to two very traditional measures that got almost no attention in the Schumann, Stee, and Bobo book. Um, the first one is a feeling thermometer. Uh, this is a measure that's been used in the American National Election Studies for many years. It essentially is described to the respondent as a thermometer measuring their warmth or coldness, their favorable or unfavorable feelings, toward a person or a group of people. So they're asked uh, about a series of politicians one at a time and about a series of social groups one at a time. And they're asked to give a number from zero to 100 to indicate how warm or favorable they feel, how cold or unfavorable they feel toward the group. So this is a, a measure of affect. And in the ANES surveys, it's been measured affect toward white people and affect toward black people. Um, in addition, the American National Election Studies has included measures of stereotypes. And this is an example of one. The respondent might be handed a card that has this seven point rating scale on it. And they're told that a score of one on the scale means that you think almost all of the people in the group tend to be hardworking. A score of seven means that you think most people in the group are lazy. And of course, you may choose any number in between. What number would you choose to describe black Americans? What number would you choose to describe white Americans? So this is the, the hardworking, the effortful characteristic. Um, there are also questions about intelligence and others as well. So these are kind of stereotypes or trait measures. And this is the anti-black affect measure. And um, so the question is, um, if, if we take seriously the argument that I showed you from Blindspot, that um, these types of measures are way too explicit. Anyone would know that they are being monitored, that giving a, uh, an anti-African-American report on these questions would be socially undesirable, uh, particularly perhaps if you're sitting in your living room across from an interviewer who has made the trip out to your home to interview you the way the American National Election Studies has over the decades. And so really we need those implicit measures to get past that self-presentational bias and to get past uh, what people might not be aware of. So what I wanna do is I wanna show you a few results. Um, and this is from a paper that Josh Pasek, uh, now tenured at the University of Michigan and a PhD from Stanford uh, wrote with our group. Um, and these are results prior to the 2008 US presidential election where a representative sample of Americans were administered the affect misattribution procedure, the AMP implicit measure and an explicit racism measure, in this case, symbolic racism. And I wanna start off by uh, pointing out two numbers here because according to the perspective that led to the development 
of symbolic racism and implicit racism measures, we would expect white Americans to report very little explicit prejudice toward African Americans, but that the implicit measure would detect quite a bit more. Um, the, this, by the way, this is a table of only white respondents. And let me just show you, first of all, for all respondents on the implicit racism measure, 48% will round this off to 50% uh, reported Afri anti-African American attitudes. And when we look at the explicit measure down below, the number is surprisingly almost exactly the same, 48%. So this is the first striking unexpected finding that there's more explicit prejudice being acknowledged than we might have expected. And there is less implicit prejudice than we might have expected. And now I have to tell you something important that this survey was done by the internet with a representative sample of American adults. No interviewer sitting across the room from the respondent, no interviewer talking to the respondent on the telephone. The respondent is privately sitting in front of a computer screen and answering these questions. And so perhaps not the kind of pressure that you would expect, but nonetheless, here we find these measures are quite comparable in what they reveal. And I'm gonna show you first a very, very simple analysis asking the question, can we predict voting for Barack Obama in 2008 using the implicit bias measure? And the answer is no, we can't. That the people who score anti-African-American voted for Mr. Obama at 42%, which is almost exactly the same as the 40%, uh, among the group who scored as pro-African-American. And as you can see here, this is a 2% difference. On the other hand, when we go to the bottom of the graph, if you use explicit racism to predict vote, voting, what you see is a 45% difference. Only 25% of people who said they were anti-African-American voted for Mr. Obama, whereas 71% rounded off percent of people who scored as pro-African-American uh, reported voting for him. So that's the first piece of evidence that's surprising if you expect that the implicit racism measures will do better than the bankrupt explicit measures at predicting behavior. Now, I wanna show you um, a different kind of explicit measure um, that I think many folks have had skepticism about. This is a very old question that the Gallup survey organization started to ask in the 1950s, the question asked if your party nominated a generally well-qualified person for president who happened to be black, would you vote for that person? And as you can see, actually a, plur a majority, a plurality, 53% of people in 1958 said they would not. That percentage dropped down to 6% by 2004. And the percent who said yes was up to 92% here. So, this is again an explicit question, and this number is not zero, but it's quite small. And one might imagine that that small number would fit with what the concerns of the implicit bias advocates would suggest. Um, and interestingly, it's not just the Gallup question. Here's a question asked in the General Social Survey. If your party nominated A, and this is between 1970 and uh, the 2010, the wording changed in the early years, Negro in the middle years, Black, more recently African-American, for president, would you vote for him if he were qualified for the job? And you can see that the percent saying yes rose to 95% in the most recent number in this graph. Again, 5%, it's not 100, 5% are left over saying no. And so what we wanna do now is we wanna go back to this set of numbers that I've showed you earlier and recognize the fact that uh, racism is correlated with lots of other variables. And we know that those other variables are also causes of vote choice. So we shouldn't take the predictive power of this table too seriously because we wanna control for all those other predictors. And so I want you to keep in mind six right here, five right here. What do we see when we do an analysis of how many votes Barack Obama actually lost due to anti-African-American prejudice? Well, the starting point for Josh Pasek's uh, theoretical innovation in this paper is the fact that remarkably, um, what he acknowledged that had not really been recognized much at all, if at all, in the literature on voting before, is that anti-African-American prejudice could cause changes in voting behavior in five different ways. So one is a person who might've been inclined to vote for the Democratic candidate, but learns that that candidate is African-American, might have said, okay, well, I, I always vote and I can't vote for that guy, so I'm gonna vote for this guy. 
That's one possible shift that could occur. Another is that somebody could say, well, I always vote. I want, of course, I'm gonna vote this time. I, I would normally vote for Democrats. I can't bring myself to vote for a Republican. So therefore I'm gonna vote for another candidate, a non-major party candidate. Or somebody who normally votes, but can't see voting in either of these ways might just stay at home. And so perhaps racism would transform a voter into a non-voter. In addition, somebody who might normally not vote might say, oh my goodness, uh, because of my prejudice against African-Americans, I don't want this guy to be elected. So I'm actually gonna vote for McCain instead of staying home as a result of my racism. Or somebody who might have voted for a non-major party candidate on symbolic reasons uh, you know, might say, oh, I know I'm throwing away my vote and I was willing to throw it away if it didn't matter, but now I might be helping this guy uh, get elected. So I'm gonna vote for that guy. So there actually are these five transitions that can happen. And Josh and Alex Tak, who was also a Stanford grad student and is now a tenured faculty member in political science at the University of Wisconsin, uh, put together a, a really innovative analytic approach to identify how much change in votes happened due to each of these factors. And I don't want you to have to read this whole table. Each of these arrows are arrows that we talked about. And these are the percentage of votes that changed. The important thing I want you to look at is this, five. So what I showed you before was, according to those explicit questions, when we said, you know, are you willing to vote for an African-American candidate? Five to 6% of people explicitly said no. And when we do this analysis, the answer is, as best these statistics tell us, Barack Obama lost about 5% of the vote. Now, if you remember, he won the popular vote by a margin of about six or seven percentage points. But if you also remember, he, that he, uh, came to the ballot box following a gigantic economic crash in late 2007. And there's so much evidence in political science that the state of the national economy has a lot of impact on voting. There's every reason to believe Obama should have won by much more than six or seven percentage points. And if you add these five to his six or seven, that's what it should have looked like. And so that the counterfactual that this analysis points to is actually quite plausible in the context of history. Um, I want to end by just telling you about a new paper that Toby Stark um, and I are just finishing. And um, we're asking this question. We're looking at the relationship between these various measures that I've told you about, anti-Black affect, stereotypes, symbolic racism, and implicit bias. This is simply a covariant structure model drawing that says we can ask a bunch of survey questions that measure each of these things, and each of these is correlated with each other. Um, I want to just show you the correlations between these measures. So the numbers to look at are in this little triangle here, and the story is quite simple. The three explicit measures, anti-Black affect, stereotypes, and symbolic racism, correlate very well with each other. Implicit prejudice does not. Implicit prejudice is almost uncorrelated. At least in one case, it's not with a huge sample. Uh, it's not, this is not even significantly different from zero. And these numbers are quite close to zero. So clearly implicit prejudice is measuring something different from the explicit measures. And what Toby and I have developed is this, which is called a second order factor model. And uh, just simply ask the question, is it possible that these are actually all measures of the same thing? Uh, this we call the P factor, the prejudice factor. Is it possible that that prejudice factor is latent in long-term memory for individuals and is a cause of answers to all of these questions? And that the real story is here, that we would all be better off uh, not arguing about, should we do this? Should we do this? Should we do this? Should we do this? The answer is do them all and put them together into assessing the P factor better than we might otherwise. And the answer is that works quite well. So let me tell you a few conclusions that I'm gonna stop. First, um, it appears that implicit and explicit racism are about equally prevalent in American society. Uh, unfortunately, uh, at a horrifyingly high rate, um, explicit racism often predicts outcomes we care about. I have only shown you evidence on voting behavior, but there's lots of other evidence in the book on that. Third, Implicit racism often predicts outcomes more weakly, um, and th this has been the focus of a great deal of work, and the book um, reviews meta-analyses that have been published, and uh, the conference uh, acknowledged that um, it is a less good predictor of most typical high-stakes behaviors um, than, the, than explicit racism is. Uh, 
Um, it appears that social desirability bias is not distorting the explicit measures so dramatically as to cause problems. And the book actually reports a variety of evidence uh, directly testing the social desirability bias charge with regard to the explicit racism measures and uh, comes up with no evidence at all that social desirability is a problem. It appears that people who are anti-Black racists in America are perfectly happy to admit it. And lastly, um, racism is costing African-American candidates votes. Uh, what I haven't told you is that uh, we have new papers showing that anti-African-American racism uh, explained voting in 2016 and 2020, uh, even though neither of the candidates in either case were African-Americans, uh, because racism became a major issue in the campaigns. Um, and the explicit racism measures are quite powerful in predicting voting in that context. So let me stop there and thank you for your time and attention and um, turn it over to Alfredo, I think. Thank you so much, Sean. And uh, before we start, I want to thank Jennifer and Daniel for inviting me to participate in this important event and uh, to celebrate your work. I hope everybody is well and safe during these challenging times. I appreciate your uh, very useful historical overview of uh, this area of research, John. Um, indeed, racism and implicit bias have been at the center of what Diane Walker, the president of the Ford Foundation, described as a season of suffering in a recent uh, blog, which has included, as we know, a pandemic that we're still fighting, an unprecedented struggle for racial, racial justice, fires, and a serious economic crisis. And although implicit bias and racism certainly have longer histories, they're painfully exposed in the persistence of police violence and the stubbornness of societal racism. I'm sure many of us are feeling relieved and hopeful after the Derek Chauvin's verdict even though much more work remains to be done. Uh, research on implicit bias has been evolving as uh, we uh, heard uh, for decades. It's been documented across multiple sectors. Uh, it's amazing the presence that you see uh, of this research, including health and mental health, least use of force, judges and juries verdicts and sentencing, traffic stops, perceptions of student misbehaviors and disability, access to higher ed, doctor-patient communications, housing markets, credit systems, neighborhood dynamics, and the labor system, to name a few. Implicit bias has also entered the public discourse. And uh, you and I had a brief discussion yesterday where you mentioned that Hillary Clinton actually alluded to it in the 2016 presidential debate. Another instance of uh, how it entered the public discourse is uh, reflected in remarks from Julie Jates, a former US Deputy Attorney General who admonished Implicit bias presents unique challenges to effective law enforcement because it can alter where investigators and prosecutors look for evidence and how they analyze it without their awareness or ability to compensate. And so as protests and debates about persistent societal racism linger, we're witnessing unprecedented promises from institutions and organizations to invest in corrective interventions and policy and professional practice reconstructions. And it is in this context then that the Cambridge Handbook of Implicit Bias and Explicit Bias and Racism is a timely and indispensable contribution. The volume is massively constitutes an ambitious endeavor spanning 32 chapters across five sections. And uh, dozens of authors actually covered conceptual issues, research advances, alternative perspectives, research challenges, and a great deal of measurement issues as John suggested in his remarks. And I really appreciate it, John, the, ref the reflexivity embedded in the handbook structure and content. I saw the volume contributors offering incisive critiques about this work, the theoretical and methodological underpinnings of the research on implicit bias. I should also say that it's refreshing that the National Science Foundation convened this group of scholars to take stock on this knowledge base and generate a research vision that will ultimately benefit the programmatic blueprint of the foundation. This is a welcome instance of a research agency investing in a paradigm expansion agenda. Uh, the handbook chapters offer multiple perspectives to explore conceptual ambiguities and methodological challenges, as well as anticipate possible futures. So John, I would like to share some of the questions and reflections that cross my mind as I review the handbook 
Let's take, for instance, the evidence on the link between implicit bias and behavior that you alluded to in the last part of your comments. Uh, I was surprised to learn the available evidence is unclear about this link. I was also surprised to read that the impact of implicit bias interventions is equivocal. These are foundational pieces in this knowledge base, yet we find rather inconclusive answers. So let me just ask a rather general question. How do you explain this state of affairs, the lack of evidence on these really basic aspects of this work? Well, the, what we have come to recognize is actually very much in line with Russ Fazio's mode model. Russ is a, one of the developers of one of the uh, implicit bias measures that I talked about before. He's a senior faculty member at Ohio State University, and he developed something called the mode model, M-O-D-E. And what the mode model distinguishes is um, behaviors performed and decisions made in high stakes, high resources, high thought situations versus behaviors performed in low stakes, low resources situations. And so, for example, um, one of the uh, great interests in, of the, the legal system in the impact of prejudice is whether it influences hiring and promotion decisions in workplaces, for example. And in those situations, when someone is thinking carefully and at length with lots of information about candidates, um, there is are both resources and the ability to, to use those resources to make information-based decisions. And the idea that we would have quick, automatic, subliminal feelings of positive or negative that would be uh, overwhelming all that information seems not to be well supported by the literature. On the other hand, imagine that we bring two people in to a lab to have a conversation for 20 minutes with each other. They don't know each other at all. They're seated a few feet apart looking at each other and um, we measure implicit bias before individuals enter that room. And uh, in half of the conversations, the conversational partner is an African-American for a white person. The, for the other half of the conversations, the conversational partner is also a white person. And um, what uh, the literature shows is that uh, the, when the conversational partner is an African-American and the white participant scores high on implicit bias, he or she blinks a lot. And I, I don't know if you can see, I'm blinking a lot now. Blinking is, it looks, makes a person look uncomfortable and makes the person seeing the blinking uncomfortable. And so it's, it's a non-trivial interpersonal behavior, um, but it's the kind of behavior about which the blinker is probably not aware. And so in a sense, it fits well with the idea that implicit bias might operate unconsciously without being monitored. And so I think that one of the many insights that, that the attitude literature has had over 50 years is that kind of thing, that it's important to recognize the matching of the attitude measure with the behavior being predicted. And in high stakes situations, obviously it's really important um, to recognize that people have incentives and often the ability to overcome that prejudice. Um, and uh, I think what's really important to recognize is that there are also tremendously high stakes situations when people have low ability, for example, when a police officer sees somebody pull out a gun, that's a situation in which that individual has to react very quickly. And you could easily imagine implicit associations influencing perceptions of the action of the gun holder, perceptions of somebody who they think is a gun holder who isn't even holding a gun. And in those situations, the cost can be just devastating. So I don't mean to minimize this, but it's just quite different from voting in an election, for example. Right. Yeah, and you know, you've used the word situation quite a few times in the last couple of minutes. And that brings me to the next question, which I think is, is an important aspect of the research. Critics of implicit bias research call attention to the gap between basic and applied research. One argument is that laboratory findings have been difficult to translate to the real world. Can you share any developments in responding to this criticism, for example, are researchers considering the use of mixed methods in which ethnographic tools are combined with experimental designs? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly true that um, political scientists and sociologists who've been studying anti-Black racism for decades have done so mostly through surveys and mostly by studying real world behaviors that unfold over time. And in contrast, social psychologists, uh, the field from which I come, uh, has accomplished a tremendous amount by taking advantage of the elegance and controllability of laboratory settings. That especially when we bring students into that setting, students being relatively naive, uh, that we can accomplish a lot to create 
meaningful social circumstances. But the question is then, to what degree does that translate into real world settings? And I will admit to you, I, I do a fair amount of expert testimony in litigation, and I've been surprised to see in some cases the confidence with which my colleagues sometimes have taken those laboratory studies of college students and uh, presume that they generalize to that to the high stakes outside world. And I think your point, Alfred, is absolutely right on, that we as a discipline in social psychology have been in the habit of presuming generalization until proven otherwise. But in fact, in this literature, and as could not have been any clearer than it was at that conference at NSF, the gap in findings between the real world data and the laboratory data are, are, are quite dramatic. I would be remiss though, if I didn't say that Project Implicit that uh, is run from Harvard uh, does have evidence of the ability to use implicit bias measures to predict, for example, differences in voting patterns between US states. So for example, uh, millions of people have gone to the Project Implicit website and taken the IAT to measure anti-Black affect, uh, excuse me, anti-Black bias. Uh, the Project Implicit folks have aggregated those numbers into characteristics of states and then tried to predict, for example, the percent of votes going to Barack Obama in each of those states. For a political scientist, that would be horrifying because the samples are not representative and they're not only looking at voters and there are all kinds of loosenesses that we know make a big difference in predicting election outcomes, which we have a hard time doing. Uh, but in this case, they have been successful in predicting patterns of voting. But here's the key thing to remember. What they're doing is using aggregates of people in states to predict aggregates of voting behavior in those states. And that can happen despite the fact that every single individual's measurement of implicit bias can be wrong. Uh, and, and yet you put them together and you get a wisdom of the crowds in the combination. And so the analysis I showed you earlier is actually trying to understand one person at a time as opposed to aggregates. And I think you know, even if the you got if the aggregates work to some degree, you got to ask, well, what's happening there? There must be some truth value there, and we need to understand that better. But it's definitely a different problem. So I I, I uh, join you in calling for more of that bridge building research in the future. Right, and that whole issue of the disaggregated versus the individual level of analysis is a critical distinction that is observing other areas of social science research for sure. Um, and I'm thinking about the implications of this uh, distance between the lab and the everyday context for the research. Do you think that as researchers begin to or, or advance the bridging of this gap, will that mean that future research will have to be grounded in a situated end of analysis? Well, I, I, I think it's important to acknowledge um, before I directly answer your question, that those of us who have wanted to try to pull these implicit measures out of the lab into the real world with real representative samples of American adults, we've run into roadblocks that uh, the respondents uh, uh, in representative national samples often don't like doing these procedures, like a college student who has to do it for filling, fulfilling a course requirement, they'll do it. Uh, and mechanical Turk worker who's making money to do it will do it. Somebody who goes to the Project Implicit website um, in order to find out if they're a racist, they will do it. But when you go to a representative national sample and ask them to use their computers or their phones to do this procedure, it turns out it doesn't work technically for lots of people. Many more people say, hey, I don't want to do this. You're trying to find out if I'm a racist or not. Uh, and so it's actually the, the idea of trying to kind of bring these measures into prime time in a routine way, I actually am worried that we may not ever be able to accomplish that. I don't know if we can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's one problem. But I think, you know, the, the idea of theoretical enrichment that you're raising seems like a great idea to me. In other words, if rather than just saying, let's, uh, let's say a few prayers and hope that the laboratory findings will generalize to the real world, let's actually build a theory to understand what's different about the lab. I mean, it's real behavior. They're real people. Uh, right. It's just not high stakes. It's not long-term consequences. They're not uh, supervisors who are going to hire somebody to work for them for five years in a profit-making context. Are there ways to transform the low stakes, uh, short-term lab studies with a theoretical framework like you're suggesting into richer ideas and maybe we can eventually get to the point of understanding it. Uh, for the moment, if we just say, look, when, when things matter, people suppress implicit stuff and they focus on implicit stuff when they have the information and resources to do it, that's probably at best an interim solution to the problem. Right. Yeah, and I look forward to seeing those developments for sure. Let's shift gears to the realm of knowledge mobilization. I'm wondering about the ways in which 
narratives from implicit bias research have traveled to the public opinion domain. How has this knowledge been appropriated by the general public? Are there any misalignments between the research community and public views? Thank you for warning me in advance you were gonna ask this question because I actually made a little slide on this. Um, <laughs> one, of the, one of the chapters in the book is uh, a national survey conducted by Gary Langer, who's the director of polling for ABC News and has been for decades. He's one of the nation's leading pollsters, one of the world's leading pollsters. And he led this effort to do a survey uh, because he was interested in knowing how many Americans had heard about implicit bias, how many Americans believed implicit bias was happening, how many Americans believed it could be addressed by training successfully. And so I'm just gonna show you a few quick results of this. Right, just to share this. Um, so very quickly, 42% um, of Americans said they thought all or most people have implicit biases of some type. Now, this is these are all and most are at the top end of a five point rating scale. Uh, almost everybody in the sample thought that uh, that people have some implicit bias. 50% um, said that when people have an implicit bias, it strongly influences their behavior. 30, only 30% 30 thought that implicit bias could be measured. Apparently they haven't uh, read the literature. Um, that 71% said that they thought training can overcome implicit bias. And 73% said implicit bias training is worthwhile. And so these numbers here at the bottom, these are in a divided America, these are pretty big numbers. And that one could certainly view those as um, reason to see public support for training programs like those that are going on now. Uh, even if the literature is not so clear, I, I'll just mention quickly that Alfredo, when you and I were talking the other day, I mentioned a discussion I had with uh, uh, an individual at a consulting company who actually does implicit bias training for companies. And when I started to ask about how do you do it and how do you measure and all that, it became vividly clear. She was using the term implicit bias, but the whole program is all about explicit bias. And so if, if the term implicit bias gives us an opportunity to have explicit discussions about explicit bias, two thumbs up from me. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, okay, Lo, so if we assume that implicit biases are introspectively inaccessible, is it fair to conclude that people are not morally responsible for their biases and what are the risks associated with this assumption? Yes, so wonderful question. And I think there are three answers to your question. One is that before this literature emerged, I think you could make the argument that people had could, could perhaps legitimately be forgiven for biases of which they were unaware. Now, remember, of course, that you know I showed you evidence from Howard Schuman's book that large majorities of Americans were perfectly happy decades ago to say African-Americans and white children should go to different schools, they shouldn't marry each other, and so on. Uh, and even today, 50% of people are perfectly happy to acknowledge it. Um, and so there's maybe only a small group of people uh, who, who hold these implicit biases without being aware of them, at least according to these numbers from representative national samples. And uh, so, and then we could, the second answer is, okay, now that this literature has uh, come about, that to the extent that people are unaware of their biases, um, then you know, maybe they are no longer morally absolved. But here's the really surprising twist that uh, Charles Judd at the University of Colorado did studies actually investigating whether people are aware of their implicit bias. So he said to them, uh, okay, here's what implicit bias is. What do you think? Do you think you have anti-African-American implicit bias or not? And then he gave them a test and, uh, and measured their, according to the IAT or the AMP, whether they manifest that. And most people who were manifesting anti-African-American uh, bias knew it, even when it was implicit bias. So I think that would say maybe my first answer was wrong and maybe people are even aware of that implicit bias. Now, to be fair, the implicit bias in, in the case of the AMP, it's a, a small feeling of pleasant or unpleasant affect that influences the sorting of uh, Chinese characters. So, you know, is that something for which we ought to hold people morally responsible? Not clear. The real issue is, are they morally responsible for shooting a gun in the wrong situation? Are they morally responsible for making choices about voting on the wrong basis and so on? And I think that's trickier uh, to have that argument. Right. And I have the impression from reviewing the handbook that there, there seems to be growing evidence about the fact that people may be more aware of their implicit biases than we had thought before. Is that fair? Indeed. 
Absolutely. Right. It's like, I mean, people kind of bought the line from the beginning that you didn't know what it was. Right. And, and recently we kind of realized, well, that's wrong. People actually do know. Yeah. Okay. Now, some commentators critique implicit bias research for presumably disregarding the role of structural forces in shaping discrimination, prejudice, and racism. What do you say to these critics? Well, I don't want to speak for the experts in implicit bias because I'm, I'm definitely more of a passenger than a core contributor to that literature. But I think uh, the, the largely shared theoretical perspective is that implicit bias, to the extent that it exists, comes from a lifetime of culture-based learning and that social structure is an important part of that. And uh, you and I talked the other day about Jim Sedanius's um, theory of all of these issues, the social dominance theory, uh, that he, uh, where he says that humans have a nature to create social hierarchies and it's easy to use easily observable physical characteristics like the color of skin um, to, to make those hierarchies happen. And to the extent that we're trying to create hierarchies in our society and trying to perpetuate them because of our nature, then that type of bias, you know, may well be something that that children learn early in life from their social experiences and that social structure is is very much at the core of of implicit bias theory. Um, The idea being that if only we grew up in a different culture at a different time, then we would have very different uh, scores on those implicit bias measures. Right. And I can see how easily it will be to fall into this circular reasoning about this point, right? Uh, Let me ask you the last question before we open the floor for comments and questions from our colleagues that joined us today. Um, I want to ask you about the samples used in this area of inquiry. Is it fair to say that there are relatively few studies conducted with Latinx, Asian American, and Native American participants? And relatedly, is the research on implicit bias paying attention to intersectionality? Uh, Wonderful question. So um, in all the studies and and in most of the studies that I've done in my career, I've been very interested in sticking with the standards of representative national samples to allow me to have a solid scientific basis to justify my conclusions to populations. And so the evidence that I've shown you today comes from samples that were very expensive to collect because it costs a lot. uh, And for uh, entertainment, if folks want to just think for a second, how much do you think it costs to hire a telephone interviewing firm to interview a thousand Americans for 30 minutes? So that's 30,000 minutes of interviewing. Uh, plus, of course, they've got to have laptop computers that they're using to make the calls and they have to be trained and they have to be supervised um, and the data have to be processed and all that. If you think for a second, what does that 1,000 person 30 minute survey cost? You might be surprised to know it costs $80,000. And you know you can do a lot with eighty thousand dollars, and what we do is one survey. And the reason we do it is because that's a method that has been shown to produce uh, consistently high accurate, highly accurate results. Um, and uh, and yet we could certainly you know move into other territories that are uh, a lot cheaper, where we say, well, I just want five thousand people. And I do studies like that too, but those are experiments for me where I'm doing a manipulation and I wanna understand what impact that manipulation has. In the end, of course, I would like to do those same studies with representative samples, but the, your question was, okay, well, what about um, group subgroups such as Latinx Americans? So it turns out I'm proud to say that the American National Election Studies has routinely in recent years done what's called oversampling. So intentionally oversampling Latinx Americans. Uh, so that there are enough of those individuals in the sample to allow very reliable analysis of them. Um, And so that is definitely uh, of interest. I would say the literature, however, that I know of has done so far relatively little with intersectionality. It tends to look at just one racial identity at a time, both of the participants, uh, reporting opinions, and of the targets. And so I'll just mention that Toby Stark, who I told you is a co-editor of this book, right. is just beginning some pretty exciting research on exactly this intersectionality idea. And um, as you and I talked about the other day, his, his notion is that if at the moment that a Swiss soccer player wins the World Cup, uh, he puts up a hand signal to signal his loyalty to his home country, which is not Switzerland, um, he is signaling dual identity. He's giving Switzerland this big gift by the, the victory, but he's also saying, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm Algerian. 
And uh, those, those at the same time, if, if society were to celebrate and highlight dual identities more than it does, is that a way to break down barriers, to reduce prejudice, to build commonalities? That's Toby's argument. And that's what he's exploring in this new research. That's exciting to see that work emerging now, for sure. Well, thank you so much, John, for your thought, thoughtful responses. This is very uh, uh, useful and, and interesting. Let's switch to questions. We have a few questions from our colleagues. Let me see, Bo asked a few minutes ago, I believe this question is about the slide you had on the Obama election. A lot fewer respondents answer the implicit bias questions than explicit bias questions. Could there be a self-selection bias? Ah, she's watching very carefully. So the, the reason the sample was smaller is because a smaller sample of individuals were invited to do that follow-up survey, not because people were opting out of the survey. So they're both, the, the two sets of analyses, one with the larger sample, one with the smaller, are, are both analyses of representative samples, it's just that a smaller group was invited to do the implicit measures. And so that analysis that involves both scores um, and involves a smaller sample. Okay, so you don't think it was a self-selection issue there. <clears throat> right. All right, so let me invite everyone to send their questions through the chat box. Uh, I'm gonna go through uh, the ones I have in front of me. Uh, Brian actually uh, praised the book, great talk. When will the book be available? <laughs> Good question. So it's uh, this, this talk is like way ahead of schedule here, that the book is going to the publisher May 1st. So okay. very soon. Uh, so Alfredo will tell you how long it takes for a publisher to publish a book, and it's not three minutes. So it's going to be it's going to be a while. We're going to have to get copy edits back. We're going to have to get uh, proofs back to look at. We've got to build an index still. Um, so it's going to be you know late next year, I hope. Right. All right. So Steve sends the following question: Could a part of anti-black voting be mediated by cognitive rather than affective processes? For example. If I think Blacks are lazy, I might think a Black candidate will not be an energetic public servant. So it turns out I saw Steve's question and I've prepared on the fly a slide to address that question. Impressive. So let, me, <laughs> let me, just because it turns out we did some research on this and I can just tell you a bit about this. So this is really touching base, I think, on the following, and I apologize, I don't have, I didn't have time to draw the arrows here, so I'm gonna do them manually. So in uh, some of Toby's work, what he looked at um, was the possibility that policy preferences on race-related issues, according to Sears and Kinder and the Symbolic Racism School of Thought, is the function, again, as I told you, of anti-Black affect and also of the stereotypes of uh, African-Americans not endorsing hard work, for example. And so what Toby investigated was the degree to which you could predict policy preferences from a blend of these two, which seemed to be the implication of symbolic racism theory. And it turns out that what he discovered was a very interesting thing. Instead of a blend that which seemed not to occur, there were two plausible models and one of them wins, I'll tell you. So the first one is the notion that anti-black affect shows, pretend there's an arrow right here. Anti-black affect causes stereotypes. So simply disliking a group leads you to believe they have uh, despicable personalities. And then it is those, uh, that cognition, those beliefs about personalities that lead you to say, government shouldn't help these people because it's their fault, they're being lazy, they're not working hard to get rewards. The alternative is, it's the perceptions of laziness that cause the anti-Black affect, and it's the disliking that causes the policy preference. So this is kind of Steve's rational word, like it's the emotion causes the cognition as a mediator. This is the cognition causes the emotion, which is the mediator. And I'll let everybody think for a second, which do you wanna bet on? Um, and you, if I could see you, I would ask you to put up your left hand for this one and your right hand for that one. But I'll tell you that the winner is this one, surprisingly to me at least, mm -hmm. that it's not the affect that's driving the story. It's the stereotypes first and therefore that, that causing the affect, which then causes the policy preferences. So uh, this was a plausible model in this particular case. Um, Steve, of course, asked about predicting voting, not predicting policy preferences. And so we should look at it in that case. That's interesting for sure. Um, okay, next question. Uh, this is from Steve again. What do we know about explicit and implicit bias toward African-Americans by white and African-American subjects? So uh, everything I've told you about today is by uh, is perceptions of and judgments by uh, white 
people, uh, but there is a literature on anti-African-American prejudice among African-Americans as measured by the implicit bias measures. And uh, I think the famous iconic story, there are two, actually two kind of famous stories. Um, one is when Tony Greenwald was on, I think it was 2020, um, early on in the, in the development of implicit bias when it was starting to become widely recognized. Um, they uh, had a, a very interesting session in a television studio where I think they might have brought in 15 people from various walks of life and they were seated on risers in rows of five or six and uh, they, they all had taken the implicit association test. And, um, the, and then what happened was kind of the moderator uh, said to each of the people, so now, Julia, I'd like to tell you, uh, you scored high on anti-Black racism. Does that surprise you? How do you feel about that? And uh, did that conversation with a number of people, including with a, an African-American gentleman who said, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, not me, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so that's an interesting case. And yet another iconic story is the story, uh, which I, I think is true, uh, I've heard it told many times, that Jesse Jackson, uh, the former politician, uh, told a story of himself walking down a street, maybe back to his hotel late at night in an urban setting, uh, hearing footsteps behind himself, and uh, eventually um, discovering that the person behind him was white, not African American, and being surprised at himself for feeling a sense of relief. Um, and, you know, that again, so that would be sort of the opposite. That would be like him being confronted with his uh, bias um, in a surprising way. So I think, uh, you know, there probably is good literature that I don't know about more than that. Um, but what I do know is that in the data we've looked at, African-American respondents do in fact sometimes score as anti-Black. They sometimes score as pro-Black. Some white respondents score as pro-Black. So there, the relationship between the respondents' race and their measures of bias is not simple and straightforward. Right, yeah. Uh, Michael is requesting that you put back up the last slide from your opening remarks. And the last slide from my opening um, remarks. You would think I could do that. Um, let's see. The last slide, I think it's this one maybe, let's find out. Um, so I'm gonna share a screen, share this. And then make this big. Is that the one we should ask? I, I'm not sure. Oh, not are the conclusions maybe? The conclusions? The question is, if you're aware of implicit bias, is it still implicit? Yes. That's, that's connected to the, the uh, what is described as the last slide. I see. So I would say everybody in uh, who's together right now gets to answer that question however they wish. I don't have any special privilege to answer that. That's not a scientific question. That's a question of definition. And I think if... Uh, I, I can see the implication of the question clearly, that if you know it, then it's not implicit by definition. Right. Uh, and, and yet another way to answer that question is even if you're, it really goes back to the way you phrased your earlier question, Alfredo, that if a person scores as anti-Black on an implicit measure, then that's showing implicit bias. And if they're aware of the implicit bias, one could label that as awareness of an implicit bias. On right. the other hand, one could say it's not implicit. Right. Um, I'm going to remind quickly our uh, audience that there is a survey that we would like everybody to take a moment to fill out. Uh, the link is in the chat box. If you have a moment, we will appreciate your feedback. Uh, Regina is asking, how do we stop racial bias from happening? What are the steps to change? Well, you know, I have to admit that I'm basically a measurement guy and I'm a person who is trying to not only understand um, the measurements that we make, but also to develop, uh, do my part in helping to develop the basic theory of the nature of prejudice and the consequences of prejudice. Um, I have not myself got any special insights. There are many of us here on the Stanford campus who are working very hard on this problem and are much more qualified than me to answer that question. And happily, they have lots of uh, compelling answers and are actually implementing them. Um, so that's a great thing about CCSRE that it's an umbrella under which all of us are. And so I, I look forward to those folks answering those questions because I'm afraid I have nothing better to offer than they have. Thank you, John. I, I, don't see, I don't see any more questions. I will ask Jennifer or Daniel to let me know if I'm missing anything. But in the meantime, I'm gonna invite you, John, to make any final remarks or points that you would like to make. 
Well, I really appreciate this opportunity, Alfredo. It's been fun talking with you. I really appreciate um, people uh, joining us today and the opportunity to do the work. Jennifer, thank you for the invitation. And um, I just congratulate you on this great institution at Stanford. We are very lucky to have you and I'm lucky to be a part of it. Thank you. Thank you for the stimulating presentation and conversation, John. It's exciting work. <clears throat> It is, and we'll all look forward to the actual publication. And uh, this has been a wonderful conversation in a week where indeed, as Alfredo, you mentioned in your comments, we've witnessed an historic moment uh, that questions of implicit bias certainly were at the heart of much of what was going on and continues to go on. Uh, particularly, we have got colleagues, Jennifer Eberhardt, working on policing. Um, the problem of race and racism really is interdisciplinary and requires many minds, many hearts, uh, in order to begin to solve, to bring in the question that was posed at the very end. And I would just like to say uh, thank you. We hope to see you next week where we'll be talking about similar issues around racial reckoning in the humanities. Um, and uh, as my father, who was a social scientist, used to say that my questions coming as a humanist, which are more philosophical, often began where his ended. Uh, so I think it will in many ways be a kind of follow on. And it's these deeper conversations where we can try to wrestle with what connects us, what divides us, and how we can be a better world uh, that really drive us. And I thank you so much uh, for this work, for this discussion, and for everyone's time. Stay very well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.